Hello, everyone. Thank you uh, again for, for joining us today for your time. Uh, I'd just like to give a little bit of background on Radiant Vision Systems. Uh, we are a world leader in light and color measurement, and we've been providing scientific grade measurement solutions for over 25 years. I'm ex excited to share Radiant's expertise in display metrology with you today and share the results of some lab testing that Radiant conducted to evaluate the effectiveness of various methods for curve display evaluation. Uh, particularly, we're going to focus on optimizing parameters to te detect small defects, such as lines and pixels in displays. Looking at today's agenda, um, we're going to start off giving kind of a curved display landscape. Uh, where do we see the market and, and where do we see it moving forward? Um, we'll then look at some of the challenges that are introduced in uh, visual performance testing of, of curved displays, breaking that down into image processing, and then, of course, detecting our small defects. Um, we'll look at evaluating the different test methods that we took um, to evaluate curved displays, and then um, discuss the results that we, we you know, got from this testing, and then, ultimately, what's the conclusion? What are our recommendations um, moving forward for evaluating curved displays? So let's get started. Uh, as we've seen an increasing number of new vehicles, displays continue to acquire more real estate within the vehicle with recent increases in size and resolution. We now see displays used in place of center stack controls, instrument cluster panels, and now mirrors. Um, available integration space, as we increase the, these displays, available integration space throughout the vehicle, especially if flat panel displays, conventional flat panel displays are used, is really restricted. With the advent of freeform and flexible display technologies, automotive interiors have reached a new era of freedom in design, where curved and freeform shapes break out of traditional flat panel integrations. Here's a couple of examples uh, from FlexEnable that uh, exemplify innovations in display flexibility that allows manufacturers to match the curvature of existing surfaces. So this means as displays as a human machine interface uh, within the cockpit uh, don't, inter, uh, don't, don't overwhelm the interior or reduce functionality. So now let's look a little bit at the benefits uh, of curved displays. Currently curved displays are aimed at replacing analog areas in direct view of the driver or passenger like such as the pedometer region and across the center stack. Uh, we even see now displays that the entire dashboard is replaced by a single display. Studies suggest the positive effect of using curved displays in the driver's line of sight, namely in the speedometer region. A concave display with a horizontal radius of as much as 1,000 millimeters, which I'm going to refer to and the industry refers to as 1,000R, has been shown to reduce visual fatigue and eye movement presumably because this curve more closely matches the natural curvature of human vision. Horizontal curvature also reduces distortion and blurring at the display edges, improving the viewer's immersion to all visual elements on the display. This illustration demonstrates where the viewer has limited focus at the display edges for flat panel displays that do not match the curvature of human vision. You can see that with curved displays, uh, the uh, curvature more closely matches human uh, vision. So looking at an example of uh, current curved display integration, uh, this example is of a concave curved display designed by Bosch for the speedometer region of the Volkswagen Torrit. This production example is a good indication of where curved displays are headed in terms of integration and with notable benefits for improving visualization and viewing comfort for the driver. So now we're gonna look at some of the challenges uh, introduced. Um, so of course, as display change shape, new challenges must be addressed in measurement. In the next few slides, I'd like to discuss some of the challenges that curved displays introduce for measuring small display defects, like those shown here. Here we see an example of a single pixel on the display that uh, is either stuck on or in this case, um, stuck off. 
we're going to focus on displays that exhibit a concave horizontal curvature and how this affects defects appearance and measurement image captured by an imaging photometer um, or colorimeter. So first, to capture an appropriate measurement image of a display, we want to ensure that the measurement area is properly lined and cropped. Um, you know, when we're analyzing the display, we're not interested, we're only interested in the active area, not necessarily the background around the display. So all of this background area should be zeroed out to ensure accurate spatial measurement across the display. This is, of course, the case with all displays, not necessarily just curved displays. But for concave displays, this could pose a challenge, especially as viewed from a single measurement angle with the imaging system aligned centered to the display. Depending on how extreme the display's horizontal curvature is, we can see an inward bowing or distortion effect at the top and bottom of the display in our images. Radiant accounts for this using a tool we call our Register Active Display Area, or RADA. Um, this is a tool in our analysis software that processes the image before analysis and actually can correct for distortion that is introduced by curved displays. If multiple images are captured to evaluate the display in segments where the imaging system is aligned more normal to the display curvature, this RADA process becomes even more important as more negative space can appear around the active display area based on the measurement angle. Uh, we also need to look at moray. Um, so moray uh, removal is also necessary for image processing in both flat panel and curved displays. However, in curved displays, it becomes more challenging to align the measurement system as, in such a way to reduce these effects. From any measurement angle, moray may pose an issue. When it comes to small defects, removing moray by defocusing is not a viable option because it obscures the small visual defects and can actually take those out. The moray removal function applied in radiance analysis software automatically eliminates obstructive aliasing, or moray, without the loss of resolution. So it actually preserves the pixel defect size and shape for accurate detection. So now once the image uh, from the display is uh, correctly aligned and registered, we need to uh, process, correctly process this image. So image from a single measurement angle with the imaging system aligned to the uh, display, defects in the center are well focused and appear high contrast, increasing detection accuracy and repeatability. You can see in this example, uh, this is a line defect, a single row of of pixels, the edge, the defect is much uh, less contrast, it's uh, you know less noticeable, where in the center we have much higher contrast and much uh, clearer defect. However, from this alignment perspective, curvature relative to the imaging system is greatest at the display edges, and these areas of the display are, uh, may fall out of focus. Given this, we see some distortion and obscuring of defects on the edges. Looking at pixel defects, we see a very similar effect. Uh, with edge defects uh, like these, we cannot, like edge defects like the that you see on the left, we cannot threshold our software analysis by a universal limit across the display to a single defect contrast, shape, or size without also including false defects. For example, de uh, debris or false defects on the display um, can have the same contrast as if we set our contrast too low as those that are uh, out of focus on the edge. So what we need to do is find ways to limit these curvature effects in order to detect all small defects reliably with repeatability and accuracy. So now looking at how do we limit these effects. There are a number of variables we can adjust to limit the effects of display curvature on the image defects. First, we can look at adjusting the measurement setup, limiting curvature by the measurement angle and the number of images captured. For example, in this illustration, the image system is actually rotated to different positions normal to the display, capturing new images at each position and analyzing these separately. So you can see in this example, 
we actually take two different images of the left side and the right side of the display. The expected benefits of this method are reduced distortion and focus issues across the display measurement images. Essentially, it's making the measurements less like a curved display and more like a flat panel. Second, we can look at adjusting the analysis setup in our display measurement software. So here, a single image of a curved display is captured and the analysis is split into three individual regions. While the display is still evaluated as a whole, analysis regions in our software allow us to apply unique thresholds per region to detect defects with unique contrast values, size, and other factors based on the relative local luminance of defects within each analysis region. So for example, we can set a high contrast threshold at the center where we see the sharpest, highest contrast and defects. And then we can use a lower threshold on the edge where we see a change in focus that results in a lower contrast, more blurred defect. We can also adjust system specifications to improve imaging effectiveness across the display. So one thing we can do is improve resolution. Improving resolution add, or adding resolution adds photosensing elements to the image capture process, ensuring that we acquire clear and precise defect characteristics. We can also improve our depth of field or our depth of focus by adjusting the aperture or the f-stop of our lens. This can help to make the focus across the display more uniform. As we observe, defects appear low contrast at the curved display edges, making them difficult for the measurement system to detect reliably. The bottom image here illustrates the defects that remain undetected on the left and right edge of the display using a measurement system that has only two megapixel sensor resolution and a low depth of field setting or depth of focus setting at f2.8. These imaging system specifications do not provide enough detail or focus to capture all defects across the curve reliably and repeatably. So one thing to be aware of as we look at increasing resolution and depth of field of the measurement system is that we can also begin to bring other artifacts into better contrast and focus, which can yield false defects in our measurement. These could be dust particles, hair, debris, or other, other artifacts that are not actual defects within the display. To reduce these errors, thresholding can be used to ensure the measurement analysis only evaluates artifacts of a specific contrast, value, and size. So in radiance lab testing, thresholding was applied in each measurement to make sure we really homed in on true display defects. The expected benefits of thresholding are increased accuracy in defect identification and reducing, or actually in most cases, eliminating false defects from our measurement analysis. What we find in our testing is that increasing resolution and depth of field allows us a bit more wiggle room to set more precise thresholds based on the increased range of values we're able to capture in the display at these system specifications. So now let's look at how Radiant utilized these different variables that I just talked about, including measurement setup, analysis setup, and system specifications to test the effectiveness of three different test, method, test, test methods for curved display measurement. Uh, as you can see in this example, this is an actual image from our uh, laboratory. Um, the analysis was based on measurements conducted in our own labs at Radiant Vision Systems on a curved monitor. So we looked at uh, three different analysis uh, and measurement setups. So uh, the first method is a single image, single analysis method. Method two, single image multi-analysis. And then method three was a multi-image analysis. And I'll go into more details of what this is in the next couple of slides. We also evaluated each method using three imaging systems with resolutions of two megapixel, 
8 megapixel and 16 megapixel. And then with each of these systems, we evaluated three different depth of field settings with f2.8, so looking at a large aperture and a high or low depth of field, f8 and f13, small aperture and a large depth of field. The goal was both to identify a best case system for each method, as well as to recommend an overall method and system for evaluation of our curved display. Looking at our, uh, the specifics of our test setup, um, in terms of the controls, the controls in our test setup included a curve monitor with a 1500 millimeter radius of curvature, or again, 1500R. This is similar to curved displays currently integrated within automotive speedometer regions, as we saw with Bosch's display for the Volkswagen Touareg earlier in the presentation. We took all of these measurements in the same dark lab and setup area, and we mounted a radiant prometric I-series imaging colorimeter to a tripod. Three equivalent systems were applied for each me uh, measurement method, a two megapixel, eight megapixel, and 16 megapixel system. So looking at method one, it was a single image, single analysis. Uh, so the process was that we used a Blackmer gradient alignment image to align the colorimeter on the display. The alignment image ensured that we reduced um, or eliminated tip and tilt and translation errors in the display. The entire display was imaged from this single alignment position and thresholds were applied across the display, evaluating the display as a single analysis region. Looking at the expected benefits, um, we with this method, we can uh, evaluate the display on a, on a whole, look at a holistic evaluation of the display. This, of course, limits measurement time. We don't have to take multiple measurements. Uh, and it limits equipment. Um, if we're just mounting the display, not moving the display or the colorimeter, our equipment becomes less, much less complex. Expected disadvantages of this method are that small defects may be distorted or out of focus on the edges. And then also we have a view angle effects that can be introduced between the display and the uh, imaging system. Looking at method two, the single image multi-analysis. With this approach, we again evaluated um, or captured a single image of the display for analysis, but employed multiple analysis regions, what we are gonna call channels to analyze the display. In each analysis channel, unique thresholds for defect contrast and size could be applied to more accurately detect defects based on their relative luminance values within each region rather than the overall luminance of the entire display measurement image. The expected benefits of this method for efficiency and holistic display evaluation were the same as method one. We also have an additional expected benefit is that we can improve defect contrast threshold based on local area luminance. We didn't see that benefit with method one. The same disadvantages applied for method one in terms of distortion and poor focus for defects at the edges uh, exhibit in method two. Then we look at method three, multi-image. With this method, we actually captured two images of the display at different measurement position. As shown in the photos here, an alignment image was applied to the left and right side of the display to align the imaging system to each half of the display separately. The alignment image shown here is used in radiance applications for virtual reality display measurement where each side of the display may be evaluated through the left or right eye. So in method three, the left side and right side of the display were imaged separately and then analyzed separately, treating the two halves as two separate displays. So it was method one and method two, we looked at one single image. Here we actually break it down into two separate images. The expected uh, benefits of this system is that we really limit the view angle and focus changes across the display. Again, as I mentioned before, uh, making the curved display look less like a curved display and more like a flat panel. This also increases our effective resolution. 
Um, because with the same resolution imaging system, we're reducing the area that we're looking at, we're only looking at half the display, our effective resolution is increased. We can also uh, test larger displays um, or displays of larger, larger curvature in a smaller space. Looking at the disadvantages, um, this may require additional equipment. Again, as we have to move the imaging system to take multiple measurements, our equipment to do this becomes much more complicated. The rotation is also can be a slightly difficult or pose some challenges to the measurement setup and limit accuracy. And then as we take more images in this example too, but as we take more images um, and measurements of the display, this increases our total measurement time. So now we'll look at the results of the testing um, that we see. So to note um, quickly, our evaluations were focused specifically on three different defect types, horizontal lines, vertical lines, and dead pixels. Uh, these are illustrated in the blue box to the right. Horizontal lines were three continuous rows of dead pixels at the top, center, and bottom of the display. Thresholding on the minimum contrast value of defects across the display allowed us to understand the minimum contrast value of these defects. Essentially, a higher contrast percent indicates improved accuracy and repeatability for defect detection. Vertical lines were three continuous rows of dead pixels at the left, center, and right of the display. The same thresholding was used for defect contrast as for horizontal lines, with a higher defect contrast percent indicating improved detection accuracy and repeatability, just as within horizontal lines. Pixel defects were two non-continuous rows of dead pixels that intersect at the center of the display. Two thresholds were adjusted to detect pixel defects, minimum contrast and minimum sensor pixel size, or the number of sensor pixels covering the defect in our measurement. A high defect contrast percent indicates improved accuracy and repeatability for detection, while a greater number of sensor pixels per display pixel defect enables more precise thresholding to remove false defects, which of course further increases measurement accuracy. So let's uh, first look at the resulting data, resulting data for horizontal line defects. Uh, here we show the um, measurement method at the top with a note in the row below about which region of the display was measured. On the left, we list the measurement system resolution and f-stop used for each measurement. So first, looking at method one, we see that when we capture the curved display in a single image, we are only able to threshold to a single contrast percent to detect all defects across the display. This contrast value represents the lowest contrast defect in the display and is used as the minimum threshold. This is a little troublesome because setting a lower minimum contrast across the display could result in detecting false defects that meet this contrast minimum. Again, the goal is to have a high contrast in our defects. We see that there are certainly positive effects to increasing the resolution and depth of field of the imaging system for a single image, single analysis measurement. Defects are captured in higher contrast as these settings increase. Increasing resolution adds more photosensing units to the measurement, allowing us to capture more precise luminance differences in the image, which increases contrast. Increasing depth of field brings all areas of the display into more uniform focus from center to edge, improving contrast of all of the defects. So one thing I'd like to point out, we see a, a drop in contrast for the 16 megapixel system at F13 compared to F8. This goes a little bit against what we might expect. This is likely the result of aperture settings and measurement setup and could further be tested using something like an MTF analysis. I'll address a little bit the difference between F8 and F13 in the coming slides, but I'd just like to point out um, you know, if you notice this. 
here we see that the highest defect contrast is captured using a 16 megapixel system at f8. This is a baseline that could be used to set minimum system specifications for this method with higher resolution systems likely improving results further. As I mentioned, in this case, we only tested up to a 16 megapixel system, but we didn't expect, uh, expect that higher resolution would even further increase this accuracy. Looking at method two, as in method one, we see the same positive impact of increasing resolution and depth of field on defect contrasts for both single image methods. The notable benefit to applying multiple analyses to a single image, however, is the advantage of setting unique thresholds for defect contrast on the center, where defects are more in focus and higher contrast, versus the edge, where defects can have uh, less contrast because they're more out of focus. Accuracy is improved over methods one's single analysis approach, even at lower resolutions and depth of field. This is because defects are detected using contrast settings relative to the analysis area where they appear. So for example, using an eight megapixel system at F8, we can more precisely threshold for center defects at a higher contrast percent, limiting false defects and set a lower contrast threshold for the edges only. Again, the highest contrast is captured using a 16 megapixel system at F8. This is gonna become a theme in our results that we're gonna see. But we notice that the contrast in general is improved using method two for all system specifications versus method one. Now lastly, looking at method three, uh, what we've noticed here is that defect contrast is fairly substantially improved across the board uh, using the multi-image approach. With the camera position more normal relative to each side of the display, defects in each image are more in focus and higher contrast. Supporting this theory, we see that depth of field has less of an impact in defect contrast after F8. Because defects are already captured in relatively good focus in each image, depth of field does not need to be much higher than F8. So essentially, we see a great improvement between F2.8 and F8, but there isn't a substantial improvement between F8 and F13. In this case, increasing resolution of the imaging system has the largest impact on defect contrast. And with method, as we saw in method one and method two, the highest contrast is captured using a 16 megapixel system. And then in this case, we saw no, uh, no significant difference, actually no difference at all, between looking at F8 and F13. Okay, so now let's take a look at our vertical line defects. Um, and we see a very, very similar pattern to what we saw in horizontal line defects which is of course expected. So in method one, defect contrast is again improved using a system with higher resolution and depth of field. Comparing systems at high depth of field settings, contrast more than doubles between a two megapixel system and a 16 megapixel system. Again, we find the highest possible defect contrast using a 16 megapixel system at F8. Looking at method two, once again, this data suggests that even a measurement system with a low depth of field setting can more accurately detect defects over method one when a multi-analysis method is applied. So what this means is that we see an improvement, meaning if you're limited by your depth of focus, or your, I'm sorry, your depth of field or your resolution in terms of hardware, you can improve your uh, methods and your approach using a method two. We can set a higher contrast threshold in the center channel without missing defects on the edge and set a lower contrast threshold in the edge channel without including false defects at the center. Increasing both resolution and depth of focus of the system continues to improve defect contrast. And again, the highest contrast is using a 16 megapixel system at F8. Looking at method three, 
but overall we see similar results. Contrast of defects is greatly increased using a multi-image method. Beyond uh, F8, defect contrast is not much improved by increasing depth of field. I talked about this in the last slide. Likely because defects are already in focus using a multi-image approach. The greatest influence on contrast using this method is system resolution. And in this particular case, again, we don't see a substantial increase between F8 and F13, but a small um, improvement in contrast between F8 and F13. Now let's look at the results of our pixel defects test. First, we'll look at the contrast values we were able to achieve using each method and system. You can see these values in blue on the left side. Again, remember I talked about before how we have two different uh, uh, parameters to address in this situation. Another thing we looked at for pixels with a number of uh, for pixel defects was the number of sensor pixels that could be used to threshold on the size of display pixel defects. You can see these values in green. One thing to note, you might notice that these contrast values are much less than line defects. Because pixel defects are really small defects, the contrast and sensor pixel values we achieve through our testing are much smaller. Essentially, the way that we process the measurement and threshold for uh, pixel level defects versus line defects is different. That can explain this uh, decrease in general contrast. Looking at method one, uh, once again, increasing resolution and depth of field settings together enabled the most precise thresholding of pixel defects. The ability to use more sensor pixels to threshold on pixel defect size helped a little bit. Using an 8 megapixel or 16 megapixel system allowed eight sensor six pixels to be set as the threshold, increasing measurement precision. As before with uh, what we saw in, in line defects, defect contrast and sensor size was optimized using a 16 megapixel system at F8. Looking at method two, we see the same positive effects of using local contrast thresholds in separate analysis regions, improving the precision of defect detection in each region. On the edge where defects are lower contrast due to focus at this position, we can set lower contrast thresholds. This allows us to set separate higher contrast thresholds for defects in the center, ensuring that false defects are not captured in the center, which would otherwise be the case if we used a single threshold as used in, as seen in measurement one, method one. Increasing resolution and depth of focus improve both contrast and precise sensor pixel size of all defects. Uniformity of defect contrast and size from the left to the right are also improved as depth of field uh, increases, which again, we would expect. So for example, values on the center and the edge are exactly the same when the depth of focus is increased to F13 for all resolutions. We actually see a decent uh, increase in the uniformity between F2.8 and F13. Once again, the optimal system settings are at a 16 megapixel system and F8. Now looking at method three, we see that defect contrast and size are improved a bit, not substantially, as depth of focus is increased. But again, the most significant factor in this method is using a higher resolution system as defects are already much higher contrast due to better focus at each imaging angle. And just as within line defects, the optimal system settings uh, are a baseline at 16 megapixel and F8 or F13. So continuing to look at pixel defects, we have another table. This table includes two other um, interesting data points that we gathered to evaluate the accuracy of each method and system uh, for pixel defect detection. 
based on the contrast and sensor pixel size thresholds that were applied to achieve best case data for each system and method, we also were able to count the number of, one, false defects. These are artifacts in the display that were falsely detected as pixel defects. When thresholds for contrast or sensor pixel size are too low, false defects can be captured. This data is shown in red. Again, the idea is that you would have higher, high enough contrast in your real defects that you don't capture the false defects. Um, we also have to address missed defects. This is the number of real pixel level defects in the display that we missed using our thresholding. This data is shown in purple. Of course, the goal is to capture uh, all real defects and have zero false defects. This uh, has a direct uh, correlation on the accuracy of the testing. So looking at method one, using a high depth of focus setting improved the ability of each system to set thresholds for contrast and sensor pixel size to eliminate false defects and ensure all defects were actually accurately captured. So if you'll notice, there's a very poor result in terms of accuracy at the lowest depth of field setting of f2.8 at any resolution. We see 11 false defects and one missed defect in f2.8, even at, um, for two megapixel rather, even at 16 megapixel resolution, we see nine false defects. This is really unacceptable for your testing environment. As we saw in the previous slide, maximum uh, contrast and sensor pixel size was achieved at seven, 16 megapixels and F8. At this resolution and depth of focus, we were able to achieve zero false defects and zero missed defects. And actually looking at this data, we can see that there is another advantage to increasing depth of focus to F13 uh, over F8. Um, in line defects we talked about, there wasn't a substantial um, benefit to using F13 over F8. Here we can see that even at low resolution, jumping from F8 to F13, we were able to uh, not capture false defects and find all the real defects. Now looking at method two, uh, we see that the accuracy for this method uh, across all systems is extremely high. Local thresholding of defects appears to play a significant role. Being able to use unique contrast and defect size thresholds in the center versus the edge region is very advantageous for catching all defects and eliminating false defects. As in method one, increasing depth of focus helped to improve accuracy with all defects captured without false defects at the F13 setting for all systems. We saw that with method one, we also see that with method two. Maximum contrast and sensor pixel size was achieved at 16 megapixel and F8. Now looking at method three, it is interesting to note that the accuracy of defect thresholding in this method is closer to what we see in method one. Uh, what's interesting is that method two provides the greatest accuracy for our thresholding based on regional contrast values. These differences are most notable at the lowest depth of focus setting at f2.8, where accuracy is lowest. It could be argued that when depth of focus of the measurement system is limited, a multi-analysis approach as in method two is, an, is ideal. So again, if you're limited in terms of your hardware, resolution and depth of field, uh, you need to employ a method like method two. However, at high accuracy, we see uh, in greater improvement. The best accuracy is achieved when the highest depth of focus uh, setting is used with all defects found and zero false defects at F13 for all systems. Maximum contrast and sensor pixel size was achieved using a 16 megapixel system at F8 or F13. Again, these are all, uh, I've been talking about all these results. These are all baseline recommendations given the resulting data from this study. Testing like this can enable us to home in on a best approach for curved display measurement and understand the effect of the setup and system variables.
So looking at the results, it's clear that higher imaging resolution and depth of field plays a significant role in the detection accuracy and repeatability for small defects. But now taking those general ideas and coming to a conclusion, what is the recommended method and system? So overall, defects were captured in optimal contrast with more precise thresholding possible using a system of at least 16 megapixel at a depth of fold of at least F8 and using a multi-image method as in method three to evaluate display in separate images. So again, these are general overall determinations that we saw the multi-image approach have the highest accuracy. And then of course, to uh, find small defects in display, we need at least 16 megapixel and at least F8. So taking both the performance benefits of the system to account, along with the efficiency, complexity, and accuracy of the measurement setup, the multi-image approach in method three may be better suited to lab environments for display design and characterization purposes. In such applications where accuracy is paramount and measurement space and time is a bit more flexible, a method that employs multiple, multiple images may be reasonable. Capturing multiple images of a curved display can definitely add time to measurements and possibly incorporate additional and more complex equipment, but the accuracy of data using this method is superior to other methods, minimizing the effect of variables due to the imaging system specifications and overall increasing the reliability of the data. However, on the other hand, in production operations where time and equipment efficiency could be the term in factory or, or is much more significant and important, a multi-analysis approach using a single measurement angle and imaging uh, could be advantage, uh, advantageous. Using a single camera and software solution with a constant position relative to the display, this method greatly reduces the complexity and time required for measurement, which can impact efficiency of measurement from display to display. One analysis regions are set, uh, once analysis regions are set in the software, the process of measurement can easily be automated. While generally speaking, defect contrast values might not be as high as a multi-image method, accuracy can, be, accuracy can be ensured using a robust system with high resolution and depth of field specifications, which enables precise analysis thresholding in each region of the display image. So what this means is as we move into production, we can approach a single measurement and get the benefits of using multiple analysis regions. So as we begin to collaborate with more customers in defining their requirements for curve display measurement, Radiant will continue to refine its methods. Uh, of course, additional testing could provide insight to common um, imaging requirements or new software features that can further improve measurement efficiency for curved displays. So let's wrap things up a little bit in terms of the presentations, and then of course we can move into the Q&A. So uh, in summary, an adaption of current display test methods may be all that is needed to ensure accurate defect detection across curved displays. In lab settings, a multi-image approach optimizes accuracy. On the other hand, in production settings, a multi-channel approach with a single image uh, but a robust system offers accuracy with reduced times, uh, time and complexity. Okay. Cool. Uh, thank you, Chris. This was, um, I think we're just about at the right amount of time here for getting started on our Q&A. see if I can open this up for us to view your guys' questions. Um, feel free to ask any questions that might come to mind in the questions window on the GoToWebinar interface. Usually that's on the right side of your screen. Um, we're gonna read through those now um, and just see what we can answer and fit into the time frame. Um, and if you have to leave at this time, we totally understand. Um, this webinar will be posted on our website later and you can review the recording as well as the slides will be emailed out to you. So um, if you have to leave, thanks for coming. And if you can stay, great. And we'll get started with the Q&A. Okay. So let's see, looking at one question. Um, 
uh, this question, when you register the display, uh, what happens if it's unique shape? So for example, in that um, the Bosch example that's in the Volkswagen Torak, it wasn't a rectangle. I talked a little bit about register active display area and how we um, find the Radiant employs a tool to find the active area of the display. Um, of course, we are starting to see freeform shapes um, in the vehicle, not all the displays in the vehicle. In fact, now most of the displays in the vehicle are not um, rectangular. Um, so what we do is we have a, um, I was talking about register active display, or we have a tool called Rita, register inside display area. And um, it uses a similar but more complex image processing technique to um, dynamically crop a freeform shape in our display. So that's a, a great question though. So one uh, question is, doesn't the display resolution dictate the camera or the imaging resolution? And that's certainly a good point, right? Um, based on higher resolution displays, you of course need higher resolution imaging systems. Um, however, sometimes it depends a little bit on the analysis and the defect analysis that we have been discussing. Uh, you of course, you know, based on the resolution that we saw, we needed at least 16 megapixels. As you get into even higher resolution, 4K, 8K um, you know, resolutions of the future, we can of course um, expect that we might need to change the resolution uh, of our imaging system or increasing the resolution of our imaging system. Here's a question. Um, is there an optic that could take out the depth of focus issue from a curved display? And absolutely. Um, you know, in this particular case, we use the optics that are standard with um, radiant vision systems, more just to evaluate the, um, how the depth of field or the depth of focus has an effect on curved display analysis. Um, you know, with something that you might see in a typical imaging system, like the ones that radiant vision system offers. But of course, as the curvature becomes, you know, as we see higher curvature, we see larger displays, uh, we could of course uh, adapt optics and look at adapting optics that can eliminate that effect. Um, let's see here. Um, so here are, uh, here's a question. Um, what about measurements uh, of other defects like MURA uniformity? So you notice in this paper, I uh, focused on, or we focused on um, looking at small defects like lines and single pixels. And uh, of course, we would expect that there's a whole um, study or a whole discussion and evaluation that can be done around small defects like MURA and pixel defects. Uh, I'm sorry, MURA and you know, uniformity, basically looking at larger scale defects in the display. Um, for this particular study, it was a little bit outside the scope, um, but we would expect that looking at contrast of uh, defects, for example, MURA is found using contrast and local contrast, we just look at it at a larger scale and that we very much might have to uh, change the way they evaluate and the way that we um, look at the results from testing like that. So that's definitely something, um, you know, I can't necessarily make any conclusions or comments on the results of those testings, but something that that could be done and that we would expect to have similar influences. Here is a, a question, is defect detection better done with grayscale or um, RGB color images? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, typically when we're looking at defect, we're looking at grayscale, white to black. Um, however, we found, you know, really ultimately what you wanna do is use a pattern that's going to show you the best results based on your requirements. Um, we've found that typically a grayscale pattern to find stuck on and off pixels is successful. However, that doesn't mean to say, um, you know, your requirements could be to find uh, the stuck on blue pixels, for example, on a curved display or the stuck on red pixels. In that case, uh, we can certainly see the benefits of using RGB color measurements to find defects. Um, here's a question, uh, which is the most suitable system to, um, for the analysis of curved displays, 16 megapixel or eight megapixel? So 
the results um, of the testing that we showed is that really 16 megapixel is um, kind of a baseline for finding small defects in the display. Um, of course, if we're looking for larger defects, which I mentioned was a little bit outside the scope of, of this particular presentation, we could look at using a lower resolution system. But for small defects in curved displays, we really find that 16 megapixels is a baseline. 